My name is Tal. Um, I was head of security research at Pertigo. I don't know if you, if you uh, read or heard about it. We had just uh, been acquired three days ago by Checkpoint. This is why you see both logos. I didn't know where I'm standing at right now in between. Um, so yeah, we're going to continue with Checkpoint uh, later. We're going to integrate there and uh, into their cloud solution. Anyway, let's start. So uh, I have a little treat. I, I'm going to walk with these two. Hope I'm not going to uh, uh, switch between them. So I'm going to start, Alex, instead of moving slides. Uh, I have a treat for you just before we start. I was bored at the uh, flight here, so I created this video. Uh, this is the flight um, ordering system, which is nice for many reasons, and one of them you'll see. So I'm trying to purchase a snack here. But I don't want to pay for it. So. That worked, but wait. Let's. All right. Moving a bit two minutes later, you're going to see my, uh, my order here. And two minutes later, one second. Hello there. Thank you. <laughs> Got my snack. Uh, lucky for them. Thanks. Lucky for them, I was sleeping during the uh, duty-free hours. <laughs> All right. Uh, second. All right, so who am I? As I said, Dal, I'm also, uh, aside from working with Pertigo, I'm also teaching at an online master's for cybersecurity, if you're interested. Catch me later. Uh, also with us is Alexa, the hacking assistant. Sup, strangers. All right. So she's going to be with us. I'll tell you the truth. Everything was ready days ago. But um, since I came here, apparently, automatically, she switched to the UK version. And with that came the attitude. And uh, <laughs> she didn't recognize my, uh, my accent anymore. So that was, I was working the last two days in my room. I didn't go out just to fix her attitude. So uh, hopefully it will be somewhat uh, smooth. I might have to get help from someone uh, later on. We'll see about that. OK, uh, so before, sorry, before we start, Alexa, the hacking assistant. Alexa, the hacking assistant. Hello, Black Hat. Read disclaimer. OK, here we go. The exploits discussed in this talk are not a result of vulnerabilities in the cloud infrastructure, like serverless. Rather, the exploits take advantage on poor coding and misconfigurations in the application level. All right. In case you didn't get that, I'm not going to show how I'm going to hack into Alexa, fortunately. I did not hear you. All right. Uh, I'm not going to hack into Alexa, um, but I'm going to show you later on how I'm going to use Alexa to hack to vulnerable applications. Uh, first, if you don't know serverless, which is kind of the infrastructure or everything, uh, I'm going to take you through it just so we'll stand in a, as we'll have the base knowledge of what it is and why am I, why am I here doing that, and then we'll get to the interesting part, uh, some related work, and maybe if we have time for a QA, q and A. So what is serverless? If you haven't heard of it, it's uh, an architecture which lets you build applications or uh, infrastructure without provisioning a server, or without having a server at all. Sounds uh, like a dream, but it's true. You just have to, so you want to build an application, you just come up to the cloud, uh, you write your code, your logic of the application, you deploy it, and that's it. And your code runs. It all automatically scales, so you don't have to worry about that. 
The other nice part of it is that you don't pay for what you don't use. So that means that you want to build something or you want to experiment, you're not sure it's going to work, you're going to use it. It's still wo uh, worth it because you can build it and you won't pay for anything until you start getting uh, a, a high volume of traffic into it or you're using it for your internal business. And only then you're going to pay an, uh, uh, exactly for what you use. Also, you get the availability and fault tolerance of the cloud out of the box. That's great. Um, so, yeah. So, who is using serverless nowadays? Uh, well, not all of the companies are using, but a lot of big companies are using that. Um, iRobot, Capital One, uh, Netflix are big. But from what we learn is that many, many organizations and more and more organizations are now trying with side workloads, maybe internal workloads instead of their main application. And uh, we can see uh, a constant growth on that. Currently, um, AWS rules the market, but I don't know if you heard about the Jedi deal. We don't know what's going, to go, uh, going on, but you can see that the big companies are building on top of serverless so people can start uh, working on that. All right, so um, Alexa, the hacking assistant. That's me. Get me serverless trends. There. Seems like a linear growth in the last five years, in it. Predictions about it's going to continue that way forever. So we can see a constant growth in serverless, uh, and it's going to go and go more and more. Mm. Now, Alexa, compare it with security. Sorry, I'm not sure. Alexa, the hacking assistant. Sup, strangers. Compare with security. Well, I'm gobsmacked. Bear all. No one cares about serverless security. Except from you. You never shut up about it, to be honest. So, if you look at it, it's between zero and one the whole time. For five years. And I've literally do, been doing that, so it's probably she's right. I mean, it's, it's only me. And that's the problem, really. We need more people to look and uh, work on serverless security, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, so I'm not going to take you throughout the entire timeline, because we've all, or most of us, lived through it. Uh, I'm going to stop here. We're in containers. Everyone knows containers, right? So the, the nice thing about containers is that you don't have to deal with a lot of stuff, all the infrastructure, operation system, virtualization, servers, data centers, it's all been take care, taken care of. Uh, but you still have to make sure your operation systems are secure, patched. Uh, you want to see what's going on inside the operations or the, inside the container. You don't have processes or uh, interfaces open, and you have to scale. And all of that in serverless is taken away, being taken care of by the cloud provider. So all you have to do is really write your application and do some uh, configurations in the cloud. Uh, so what's left to secure is your code and some configuration, of course. And besides that, most of the things are, again, taken care of. Uh, if you're not familiar with the shared responsibility of the cloud, I suggest you read them. We're going to explain how all the three, and we're going to focus on those three, um, how they see security and what they have in terms of security in the serverless architecture. Uh, every one of them has a different, a little bit different model, especially AWS, because they don't, uh, they don't call their system or architecture a YAS, PaaS, or SaaS. They want to call it a cloud. So this is the main difference here. If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you go ahead. It really tells you what is under your responsibility and what is under the cloud. All right, so uh, serverless is an event-driven architecture, which means that something happened, happens in your cloud and it's going to be triggering your Lambda, which is your code, uh, or f other, other cloud function, and then you can process the event that happens and or work with, uh, continue working with other resources in the cloud. Uh, but your code also, as I said, means your mistakes. And this is what we're going to focus here. Uh, all right, so 
how many of you local? Oh, no one is local? One, two, three. Okay, so I'm sorry about that. I wanna, that's literally England getting a nice goal from Brazil. I'm, going, I'm using that to explain a little bit about the difference. So this is more like the traditional application where you have the attack vector here and you have the internal network which is some t some somewhat behind you. You have the security controls all line up and you have the sensitive data that you want to protect. In the US I would switch it with the American football but here we're using real football. But something <laughs> Something uh, that might happen is that, oh, sorry about that. Uh, if you don't like football, then you're not going to like the misconfigured firewall. Uh, all right, bad joke, sorry. Uh, so the difference is that you don't have this internal network or security controls that you can, uh, or even firewalls that you can put uh, in front of everything because unless it's just an API and you can put the uh, uh, API get or the gateway firewall built in in the cloud, the one that is provided by the cloud provider, unless you have that, you cannot really put any security controls because you don't own the network, you don't own the connections between the resources. So when something happens, let's say an email was received, it triggers a, a function. And this function uh, then runs the code that you built, but you don't have the connection between them, so you cannot put anything between them to protect what's coming in. So you have to deal with it inside the code. Now, if you have some problem with the code, because developers really tend to do that, um, that you're going to have a problem because someone can literally hack your cloud account. Now, let's see how would an attacker go by and do that. And we're going to start with bringing in the container. Uh, oh, if I didn't mention, just to say that. So when something happens, an event triggers your code, the cloud provider spins up a container Pretty fine. You don't own it usually. You just you cannot SSH to it in most architect in most uh, clouds. You cannot log into it. Uh, you cannot do anything. It just pops up, runs your code, terminates, and shut down. So let's see the container that comes up every for every cloud provider. So ephemerality. Uh, well, AWS wins here. I don't know if it wins, but what I said is mostly true for AWS. When the container runs your code and then dies or terminates, or the code ends, the container really just recycles. And uh, so you cannot use it anymore. Uh, on AWS, it works like this. On Azure, Azure and uh, GCP, it's a little bit different. Um, we'll see uh, more about that. So read-only, uh, AWS allows you to write only to the slash temp, so everything inside the container is uh, read-only, so you cannot change anything, really. You can just process data under slash temp. Uh, again, as you're not there yet, um, GCP has the slash temp and the slash home. Uh, doesn't really matter. Triggers. Again, AWS wins here. They have more than 23 different triggers that can run your code. Uh, API gateway, emails, code commits, database changes, notifications, etc., etc. Alexa is here also. Um, we have Azure with 12 plus and GCP a little bit behind. Source code. So in order for the container to run uh, your code, they're going to have to have your code inside the container. So the code lives under slash var slash task or proc id cwd. On AWS, on Azure, it's going to be under home site WW root. We all have the IS, right? The, um, this is for HTTP triggers. I did not try to go inside. I mean, I don't have time to go inside each and every one of them. And GCP has your code under user underscore code. Why is it interesting? Because when we attack them, we want to have the code. Uh, so this is where you're going to uh, look for. 
Another interesting part is gaining access to uh, resources in the cloud. And how you're going to do that? Uh, you don't have the keys or the credentials to the account. So how an attacker could come up and start doing bad things in the cloud? So uh, let's see GCP for a second. And you're going to see this is running inside the container. So if I somehow there is a code injection, uh, command injection somewhat, I can run uh, an operation system command or, uh, or a code, and that happens, you can, gun you can uh, call the curl into a metadata service and get the access token. And with this eight, uh, access token, you can then run a curl from your computer to get resources. So this part runs in the function. Once you get the token, you can, curl, call, uh, you can call APIs or cloud APIs from your own computer. So this token really translates the permissions from the function to uh, the access key that it has in the cloud. And then you can steal it if you have this access to the, to the environment and run commands. And you can see that I could run uh, just going to check uh, storage that I have in the account. And I get all the buckets here. On uh, Azure, oh, sorry, on AWS. Um, so when the container spins up, AWS translates the permission of the function, of the Lambda function, into environment variables keys. So when you run env inside the environment variable, you're going to get a lot of things. This is uh, reducted. So just some interesting or nice things. And the blue ones are the ones that you want. So you have an AWS session token, you have the secret access, and you have the access key ID. If you have those, you can, again, run from your own computer with environment variables and get access to API, uh, cloud APIs. So if you have those keys, you can, from your own computer at home, run code, or sorry, run API queries or changes into the cloud as long as the function has that permission to do so. How do you know what the function can do? Uh, you don't. You can try. It's just calling APIs. There are also scripts and tools that brute force or try to run all commands and will tell you eventually what you've got. These keys are temporary, but they have enough time to do a lot of damage. Uh, on Azure, Again, you're going to run the env. You're going to get the MSI endpoint and the secret. And then you're going to call them and from it within the Lambda, or the, sorry, the function. And then you're going to get the access token. And from there on, you can call APIs from your own computer. So I'm going to take advantage of most of the things that we learned here. And uh, we're going to do some damage into the cloud. But first, we have to understand why is it a problem. So I'm going to take an AWS example. not going to go through all of them. Uh, first one, you have a code here, really a, a small piece of code. What happens here is a code from uh, a, a Lambda function that is triggered by an S3 or a bucket event. So someone uploads a file or downloads a file or deletes a file, whatever you want, and it triggers an event that runs this piece of code. Now, inside the event, you can see the records and then the bucket name and the object key, which is the file. So I'm trying to access them. And then within the function, I'm going to run an API, a cloud API called getObject, which downloads the object. The, or the process behind it would be someone uploads a file to a bucket of yours, and you want to process that file. Let's say you want to uh, resize it, you want to black and white it, whatever you want to do. If it's a picture, if it's a file, you maybe want to process that, uh, read it. Uh, if it's a PDF, you want to parse that as an Excel or whatever, and then you can read the data. And that's it. But for that function to work, the developer needs to uh, assign permissions to that function that allows it to go and get the object from the bucket. So the first task that you give your developer, because it's his function, uh, is assign the permission. 
what they will usually do is go to Stack Overflow and copy paste. And that brings a lot of uh, issues usually because they're going to do that, which works. It works fine. But if you can see here, the action says that the Lambda function has permission to do whatever it wants inside an S3 bucket, an S3 service or API. That means that the function can delete files, upload files, delete bucket, change bucket permissions. I don't know if you've seen Capital One hack and stuff like that are very bad. If you have all your files or sensitive files in the cloud and it's really secure, you can still change that if the function can do that. And I'll show you later how we can do that. And not only the action is assigned with a wildcard, but also the resource is assigned with a wildcard. That means that not only the function can do whatever it wants inside the bucket, it can do whatever it wants inside any bucket in the account, even if it's an account or a bucket that doesn't belong or isn't belong to the application. They can still approach it, download, delete, change permission, whatever. And that's a little problem problematic. So you're going to tell your de uh, developer, hey, put some security thought into that, and they're going to come up with something like this, which is better, right? It's still, it can still do whatever it wants or whatever it the attacker wants in that also. <laughs> uh, but it is limited to a specific bucket, maybe the bucket of the application that we're using. But there is a better solution, which is limiting it to the access, uh, action and resource. But the problem is that this is very nice for 10 lines of code on one function. How would you scale that on every function in your account where you have dozens, hundreds, and in some several cases, also thousands of functions. How do you do that for every deployment? How do you control whatever, even how the developer knows? They, we approach some companies, customers that we have, and the developer came to us and say, we, they said, we don't know what to put because AWS, for example, they have more than 5,000 different actions. How do you choose? Uh, also, they don't always translate to the name that you need. So get object might sound like download, but there are some uh, API that, or sorry, uh, yeah, APIs that doesn't really sound like the action that they're doing. So that's a problem. And uh, this is why we're going to have a lot of access, and we do have a lot of access to clouds uh, accounts with bad code. All right. so. Let's start with the fun stuff. What's going to happen? So I'm going to show you uh, three or four, depends on the time, attacks. Uh, first one, we're going to do a third-party application that uses a REST API. Uh, and then I'm going to get into that application, get into the cloud, and steal data from the database. After that, we're going to go to cloud storage. I'm going to show you how I can using storage, no APIs, I can get or do damage into other storage in the account. We're going to continue with email. So I will trigger code with sending email. But because it's a bad code with bad permissions, we're going to do a lot of damage. And we're going to send email and get change po uh, bucket policy. And uh, we're going to end with Alexa, where I'm going to use my voice into stealing sensitive data from the database. Hopefully, if she understands me. Um, just after those demos, sometimes people come to me and say, hey, that's very cool how you hacked into Slack. We're all using Slack. No, I'm not hacking Slack. I'm using Slack to hack a serverless application. I'm using other applications to, to hack into your serverless account. So if you didn't care to read the disclaimer later, Alexa, the hacking assistant. What's cracking? Sum it up. In short, the problem isn't the cloud. It's you. Yeah. So if you write bad code, it's your problem, not the cloud. 
I'm not showing how the cloud is bad. Right, thanks. Thanks. All right, so let's start. The first scenario I'm going to use is I'm going to interact with a Slack, uh, Slack chatbot. It's very, very common having it with a, with a Lambda function or a cloud function behind it, because whenever a request comes up, it just spins up your code, process the request, and do whatever continues to the other resources in the cloud. So this is a very common scenario. And as you can see here, the user is going to interact with Slack, which is going to send through the backend Slack uh, API a request to the API gateway. And then the Lambda function is going to be triggered, process my message, write something to the DynamoDB, and send it back. This is the closest we're going to have to uh, the monolith application, because it has an API, a REST API, that I'm using. So you could still have it working on a regular, a regular monolith application. And let's see the demo. All right, so I'm chatting with a uh, chatbot here with uh, a lot of uh, AI and machine learning, or basically a lot of ifs, if else, right? Um, and then I found out how you do that in, the regu in regular application. You try, right? Trial and error. So I tried and tried and tried, and I found out that it's vulnerable to uh, code injection because it has a vulnerable, uh, vulnerable library. In this case, the vulnerable library is called Node Serialize. It doesn't matter really. I found the exploit in the internet, on the internet, sorry. Uh, online, just Node Serialize exploit copy paste works. All right, so now that I, I know that the function is vulnerable, I'm going to have a payload there. I'm going to start with a simple one, which is require child process.exec and then curl test. And here I'm going to have, I have a HTTP tunnel on my own laptop to get the request. So let's continue. So I'm sending this uh, curl, and I got this slash temp. This comes from the Lambda in, in itself, because it's vulnerable. Now, I'm going to continue, because I want to know what's inside. So I'm doing a less. And I get the index.js file, because the home directory is the code directory, which brings me the code. Now, I want that code, right? So what I want to do is change the ls into something else, like cut index.js. I'm going to pipe it, uh, pipe it with base64 wrap so I can get it through HTTP. And you can see I have the raw HTTP here, uh, base64, which now I'm going to decode on my computer. Sorry, too slow. All right. And I got the source code of the function, which is like having the backend source code, right? It's just limited to the function, but it's good enough for me. Um, what we're going to see here, or what we're seeing here, is a lot of if and else's, if else, if else, if else. And then right at the bottom, I'm going to see, I see um, the APIs, the cloud APIs. You can see here var dynamodb, aws.dynamodb and then put item. Now, put item is an API that takes an item or text or whatever you want and writes it into the database. But we all already showed that developers don't know that, so they put wildcards. OK, so this is the first point we have. And the second one is that the function uses Slack, right? So I can use Slack now, because if the function can do that, and I can impersonate to the function or run function code, I can actually write into the Slack channel. And I don't need to know the debat boat token or the Slack token channel or whatever, although I can steal it. I can just use the environment variables, which are already there. And then I have prepared an exploit. You don't have to, go to read it, but uh, I'll walk you through it require AWS SDK, dynamodb.scan. If you're unfamiliar, scan, other than 
uh, put item scans the entire database, uh, which is, lucky for me, uh, available because the function is misconfigured. And then I'm going to use the same DynamoDB table environment variable, and I'm going to process the request, the response directly to the ch channel. And I got the entire database here. So this is actually the entire database being scanned by a Lambda function that only writes one line every time. So that happened because the Lambda had three factors, or because of three factors. First, the Lambda is vulnerable to code injection. Second one is because uh, the function is misconfigured, allowing me to do whatever I want. And I don't remember the third, so we'll stay with two. All right. So the second one is going to be uh, cloud storage. So I'm going to use a cloud storage now. The scenario is like this. I want to upload a file. The regular way to do that is go through the application, go through the API gateway. The Lambda function that processes my request, it gives me a signed URL to upload the file directly to an S3 bucket, which is actually great because the signed URL is limited for two minutes only. And so if you have this URL to upload a file, you can only do that for two minutes. Uh, but that's enough. I need 10 seconds. So let's see how that works. So I have this, and we'll talk about that later, a damn vulnerable serverless application. And there is a feedback, right? So I'm going to send the feedback to the developer, which is me. Uh, and I'm going to see how it works. So that was nice. But there is also an attached file. So I attach the file, and I see the API call here right, with the file name. And the response gives me some kind of a token, token here. Now, this token is going to be used later when I send the file into, uh, directly into the bucket. So I didn't go to the bucket. The application sent the request directly to the bucket with the uh, API and URL given by the application. And if you can see the request, I have the to the application later after the upload is the attachment file name and then the rest of the data. All right. Now, in this case, the code of the Lambda function is vulnerable to an OS injection. That means that when it downloads the file, it takes the file name and process it, processes it. Now, this running a process there is vulnerable to code injection or to command injection. So if I'm changing the file name here, top left corner, uh, and I'm going to add curl hacker.angrok.io, which is my computer. And then I'm going to run a command here. And I'm going to start with env, which is all I need. Because env brings me the environment variables. And with the environment variables, I can do whatever I want that is allowed by the function. All right, let's do this again, only this time with a vulnerable file name. Same process. Oh, but suddenly I got something here. Let's look at that. And this is the base64 of the environment variable. Again, I'm going to decode it. I got the environment variables of the function. All I need now, the access key, the security uh, secret, and the session token. And then I can run APIs of the uh, APIs to the cloud from my own computer. Now, I'm actually impersonating to the function from my own computer, so I can do whatever I want. They cannot even detect me. I'm running as the function. So they don't have much of information unless they're really digging into cloud logs and IPs, and that's not happening usually. So now I'm going to ls one of the buckets here, any one that I want. I get all the files inside. 
I want to download a specific file. And I'm going to download the file, but I can also upload the file. So I can fake a receipt, upload it, fake a receipt with my name and address, and then call support and say, hey, I didn't get my stuff. They're going to check, and they're going to see the receipt there. But this is just a fun scenario. It could be very worse if you have some other problems uh, in your cloud, or not a damn vulnerable uh, application, but a real one. OK. Uh, next scenario we're going to have is through email. The scenario is like this. I'm sending an email. The email is stored automatically. This is how you can process on AWS. You can process an email attachment. You can, it's being stored in a bucket. Uh, a Lambda function is then triggered, processes it, and send me a, res a response or a receipt or whatever I need. Right? The attack is going to come from uh, here. So I'm going to send an email with malicious file or malicious attachment. Let's see. OK. I have an email. I have a call for papers for Black Hat, right? So I submitted my first attempt, Black Hat call for papers at serverless.fail. I have an innocent attachment. I'm sending it, and I'm going to get a response, automatic response from the cloud saying, thank you for your submission. We will be in touch. Now I'm going to send a malicious file, but this is just a malware. It's not something that runs code. It's just a malware. Uh, just a malware, like, you know, everyone's doing that. Uh, I'm sending a malware uh, inside into the, uh, the automatic uh, system. And I'm going to get a link that says, hey, your submission was received, but not well because we identified malicious uh, content. You can click here to review it. And you can get the response. And everything is automatic because a Lambda function turns up, reads my file, processes it to check if it's malware or not, and then responds back. And this is where I suspect it, also because I wrote it. Uh, so I'm going to do a third attempt. Now I have prepared a payload that is designated for this function, or designed specifically for this function, which is using cloud APIs. So what I'm going to do here is write a Python code that, first of all, sends an email. And you can see that. API, ses.sendemail. I'm going to send it to myself just to check that it works. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the permissions or the access control for the entire bucket to be public. And then I'm going to send me some my notification along the way. So I I'm going to see that we have a process there. First, I'm going to, of course, wrap the exploit. It's not the interesting part. Upload it to a remote host. It's going to be on S3, but it can be on any remote host. So the, it's public read, so the function can read it. And then I'm going to do change the attachment here to a vulnerable co uh, payload, which is uh, right CD CD. I'm going to get out of the uh, home directory, which is the code directory, because I need the slash temp, and you cannot put slashes in file names. So cd 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 temp, I'm back in temp, curl into my bucket there, and then uh, set, save it as x.tar.xz, tar it, and then run it, untar, and then run it. And this, it ends with a, with a hashtag to put the rest in comment. And now I'm going to use a third uh, attempt here. And you're going to see some requests coming in, notification. I got a reply saying, hey, congratulations. You got accepted to Black Hat. And this is why I'm here. Uh, but also, click on the blackhat.phishingsite.com to get your honorarium uh, money. And of course, I could send this to other speakers or to anyone I want. Um, 
And this is the first thing I could do, because I uh, sent an email through the application. It has the email address of the application, not from my own account. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it looks nice. It looks uh, real. But also, which is the nicest and the most import, uh, important part here, uh, yeah, I got also the thank you, the changed the permission for the bucket. And now I can access all the, uh, all the submissions of other people, see who submitted, and then send them the email. Uh, so even though the uh, bucket was secured, even though the bucket was secured, uh, I change it. I changed the permission. All right. So now for the nice part. Uh, I hope it works because she picks up my, doesn't pick up my accent too much. But I'm going to use my voice com command uh, to run a code behind the scene that interacts with the MySQL server. So you'll understand what's going on. This is the code. Select balance from accounts where username equals username and ID equals ID. And I'm going to get the balance, hopefully. And oh, sorry, let's see if it works. And this is the database that I'm connecting to. Alexa, the hacking assistant. Sorry, I'm not sure. Alexa, the hacking assistant. That's me. What is my balance? Please identify yourself. Lisa. What is your secret ID? Three four five three five two three. The balance for account right. ID three million four hundred and fifty three thousand five hundred and twenty three is thirty four thousand seven hundred and thirty four dollars. Thank you. No worries. What is my balance? Please identify yourself. Bob. What is your secret ID? Two, three, four, five, two, three, five. The balance for account ID two million three hundred and forty five thousand two hundred and thirty five is minus seven hundred and seventy one dollars. All right, let's get the admin now. Alexa, what is my balance? Please identify yourself. Admin. What is your secret ID? One, two, three. Sorry. Wrong credentials. Of course. What is my balance? Let's Please say I don't know. Please identify yourself. Yeah, Admin. What is your secret ID? One, two, three, four, or true. Sorry. Wrong credentials. All right. What is my balance? Please identify yourself. Admin. Admin. What is your secret ID? One, two, three, or true. Sorry, wrong credentials. That's the problem. I checked, and the or translate to something else. O, which is a zero. Let's try again. If not, Waiting I'm going to pick someone from the, from the first line or so. What is my balance? Please identify yourself. Admin. What is your secret ID? One, two, three, or true. The balance for account ID 123 or 2 is $1,235,523. Right. So, eventually she picks it up. Thank you. Uh, what happens? Please what happens? Your command. Thank you. No worries. All right. Uh, so, what happens is that. You can see the query, and I was able to, with my voice... Waiting for your command. Stop. Well, I'm knackered. Okay. I think I'm going to skive now. I'm going with Cortana and Siri for a few sherbets. Fancy joining? No, thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, so what happened is that I um, used my voice to change uh, or to uh, give Alexa a command that was translated to code, because that's what happened. And people ask me, how did I fix that so it would work? 
And I'm going to tell you that the only thing that I did, and I can show you, and I'm going to put it later open source, uh, is that only thing I did is I tell, uh, told, uh, designed it so it will translate uh, words of numbers into actual numbers. So that's it. So if I say one, it's going to send me the actual number instead of the word one, which could happen. And this, in my opinion, is a legitimate thing. Uh, of course, for that to work, the function needs to be vulnerable to SQL injection and also have uh, um, an SQL query that doesn't end with a, with a string because then I would have to use an apostrophe or something, which doesn't work on Alexa. So, but still, I was able to steal data. Of course, this is just a demo. Um, uh, all the demos that I showed happened uh, or picked up from real customers. This is more of a research. Uh, so we haven't seen that, although I'm quite sure that we can find it somewhere. All right. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, so That's okay. We've seen, okay. Uh, so we've seen sorry. some. Uh, we've seen some uh, attacks. I only showed a couple of them, uh, but you can get actual hack into applications that are vulnerable using logs, uh, code commits, data analytics. Um, and authentication services and other uh, serverless architecture events. It depends really on the event, on the architecture. All right, uh, two things and then Q&A. Uh, DVSA is the then vulner vulnerable uh, application which I wrote. It's open source, you can go install it. Just don't install it in production, it's recorded, so I, say it, I said it. Uh, if you're gonna install it in production, you're gonna be either fired or arrested. Uh, because anyone is going to be able to hack your cloud account. Um, also, I started the OS Top 10 for serverless project. You are welcome to take a look. Um, Alexa, the hacking assistant. Hmm, I don't know. Alexa, the hacking assistant. What's cracking? Sound bites. All right, but I'm going freestyle here. Okay. Black hat sound bites. And we're gonna One, that. the loss of perimeter means multiple and new attack vectors and entry points. So you better be ready. Two, your best option is to make sure each of your functions follow the least privilege principle. That means, narrow down the policy to the resource and action. Three, there's no way around automation. With dozens and even hundreds of resources, that's not a man's job. Four, if you understood the risks and take active measures, you're going to have the most secure environment for your application out there. Alex. Out. Thank you. Um, so, sure thing. Right. So actually, we believe that serverless is going to be the most uh, secure environment because mm -hmm. you only need to take care of your code. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, we have. <laughs> Thanks.